You know, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was one of the greatest theories of all time because it explained how species change over time. So basically, how does it work? I love this little cartoon here with these ravens eating these beetles. Mmm, yum, yum. Green beetles, our favorites. What's happening here is that these ravens, or crows, I'm not sure which one they are, are eating green beetles. What that means is the green beetles are less likely to survive and pass on their genes to the next generation. But the orange or these brown beetles do. So over time, what happens is brown beetles become more common in the population. That's natural selection in a nutshell. It's the differential survival of individuals in a population. It's saying that whenever you live, survive, and reproduce, that is not random. Let's go back to Darwin and figure out how he came up with this theory. Now he really had four ideas or four postulates. First of all, Darwin realized that there is a lot of variation among individuals within a population. And uh, if you look at these crown anoles from El Yunque uh, National Forest in Puerto Rico, you can see that there's a lot of variation among these individuals that we found within one mile of the road. And Darwin realized all this variation among individuals from making thousands of observations as he collected organisms and sent them back to um, Great Britain. He also realized that some traits are heritable, like uh, Joffrey's hair color from Game of Thrones. Hmm, it's not black. Hmm, I wonder who his parents are, because he inherited that golden colored hair, not from his supposed dad. Hmm, I wonder who it could be. Darwin also realized that many more offspring are born than can survive. I mean, this is a mass of tadpoles. Very few of these tadpoles will ever survive to becoming an adult. And if you remember, this is also being influenced by Malthus, who realized that every population is capable of exponential growth, yet we're not covered in frogs worldwide. So lots more that are born than can survive. And that means who survives and reproduces is not completely random over time. What he realized is that the best fit are most likely to survive and reproduce. And I want to get this survival of the strongest out of your brain. It's the best fit. So for example, you don't have to be strong to survive and pass on your genes to the next generation. Look at this Katie did. Look closely at it. I mean, it looks so similar to a leaf, uh, not just a leaf, I mean a, a decayed leaf. Even the rear end of it looks like it's been chewed up by something. And the idea is that the more closely this katydid resembles a leaf, the less likely it is to get eaten by a predator like a bird, and the more likely it is to pass on those genes to the next generation. So what happens over time is that natural selection slowly causes this adaptive evolution as you gain favorable alleles in the population. Hmm, that sounds like the definition of evolution, a change in allele frequency in a population from one generation to the next. So natural selection is causing the frequencies of um, alleles that are beneficial to increase in a population. In addition to, uh... now there's a couple of things I wanna clarify really quick. Really, natural selection acts on the individual. It does not act on a population. And specifically with an individual, it's selecting for favorable phenotypes. So any allele associated with a favorable phenotype, that's going to increase in a population. It turns out that there are variations of natural selection. One of those is directional selection. And this will change the average value of a trait. So you can see the graphs right there. You got before selection and you see a normal distribution. And after natural selection is acted on a population, you see that the average value of that trait has changed over time. Let's take an example. Here we've got cliff swallows. And this is to show you what a cliff swallow looks like. They're these small birds. You probably have seen them, especially out west where they nest under bridges. And if you drive over the bridge, you'll see hundreds of them come out. It turns out that during a storm a few years ago, they had all this data on cliff swallow sizes. And what happens is 
The storm came through, it killed a lot of cliff swallows, but it didn't kill them randomly. It turns out that the larger individuals were more likely to survive that storm. Now we can see that this was directional selection. It didn't select for um, both small and large, it selected only for the larger ones. So any alleles involved with making these cliff swallows slightly larger were uh, kept and in, in, uh, sent to the next generation. So now they became more dominant in that next generation. Hence, we've changed the allele frequencies here in one direction to make these birds larger. You can also have stabilizing selection. Now, stabilizing selection is the exact opposite of, of a directional selection. What's happening here is it actually reduces the amount of variation. So let's take a look. A great example of stabilizing selection occurs in humans. Basically, it goes like this. If you're too large, you're likely to become damaged as you're being born, or you could also damage your mom. Both of those are likely to um, increase your rates of mortality. On the other side, if you come out too small, you also exhibit higher mortality as well. So what happens is birth rate is supposed to be right around seven pounds. So as you can see, that there is this stabilizing selection for the trying to reduce the extremes. You don't want to be too large or too small. In nature, we also have stabilizing selection on animals like horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are one of my favorite organisms. And this is a pair coming up to nest in North Florida. And they have looked like this for almost 450 million years. And when we see uh, fossils of these guys, they have barely changed. It's amazing. So that's some nice stabilizing selection for you there in nature. There's also disruptive selection. And disruptive selection increases the amount of variation of a trait. So in this case, you're selecting for the extremes. You know, one of my favorite examples of disruptive selection occurs in these phenotypes of these beach mice. It turns out that, uh, you know, mice, if they're living behind the sand dunes out in the woods, they will need to be brown, and that works well for them. But if they're on the beach, they need to be white. So what happens if you're in between this brown and a white, you don't do well on the beach, you stand out, or you stand out in the forest. So in this case, uh, this type of selection is going for the extremes. This maintaining a population of basically white mice that occur on the beach and brown mice that occur in the woods. Another type of selection is called balancing selection. Now this occurs when there's heterozygous individuals. That means you've got both versions of the alleles have higher fitness than an individual that's homozygous. And that's the, and if you remember, homozygous ones are have two copies of the same allele. And basically this means that there's a balance among several alleles, and especially in a population, a population can easily have two or three or five or multiple alleles for a single gene. Now remember, an individual can only have two alleles at most, but in balancing selection, there might be a balance among several alleles, not just one. And another way of thinking about this is that certain alleles are favored when they are rare, but not when they're common. Now let's take a look at this. We can have what is called frequency dependent selection in a scale eating cichlid. That's kind of wild. There's actually this fish and what it does is it comes up to other fish and takes a bite out of them and basically is eating their scales. Now they can have a right mouth or a left mouth version of this. Okay. Now think about that. That means the mouth isn't exactly right in front of the fish. It's either off to the right or off to the left. But what happens is they don't want 100% of the population to be all left or 100% of the population to be all right because what happens if everybody is feeding off the exact same side of all of their prey, they're gonna start damaging their prey and um, they'll die and then they'll, they won't have enough food. So in this frequency dependent selection, what's happening is that as one so, as a right mouth fish becomes more and more common in a population, then it becomes less fit. And so the alleles that cause it to be right mouth decrease in number and the alleles for the left mouth increase. 
up to a point. See, this is where that frequency dependent. As a frequency of the left mouth becomes more common, guess what? Its fitness goes down and it begins to decrease in the population again. So what happens is over time, That's not the only example of balancing selection. In the eastern United States, there's this really cool fish called an eastern mosquito fish. And there's the males, and it's called Gambusia holbrookii. And basically, if you look at that fin on the bottom, it's kind of long and, and narrow shaped, that's an anal fin, and basically it's a modif modified gonopodium. These fish have internal reproduction and give birth to live young. How cool is that? A fish giving birth to live young. Well, it turns out that with Gambusia holbrookii, a small percentage of the population are melanistic and they're, they have all these dark blotches over them. Well, those darker fish are a little bit larger and slightly more aggressive. So what happens is when they're very rare in the population, they have higher rates of mating success with the females, so their numbers increase slowly in the population. But if they become too common, like anything over 5 to 10 percent, well, they will start to damage the females, and then that phenotype becomes a disadvantage, and their numbers go down over time. So this, is once again, is an example of frequency-dependent selection that if they're rare, they're selected for. As they become too common, they're selected against. And that balances their numbers in the population, so they're always a little bit around, but never Another type of balancing selection is a very common one that most people are aware of called heterozygote advantage. Sickle cell disease is an example of this and it's also frequency dependent selection as well. Now for those of you that don't know, sickle cell disease is a problem where you, if, you're, if you're heterozygous, you have a slight resistance to malaria. And if you don't know anything about malaria, of course, malaria, well here's some facts. Malaria is spread by a certain type of mosquito in the genus Anopheles. It affects almost 220 million people each year. I mean, think about that. That would be two out of three people in the United States each year affected by malaria. But most infections are around Africa and other areas around the equator. And I mean, this disease kills like 450,000 to a million people each year. And between 1950 and 1950, it killed almost 100 million people, and it's killed more than any other disease in human history. And uh, each year, we spend like $3.1 billion spent on malaria control, and what they do is they spray these broad-spectrum insecticides to kill off the mosquitoes. So here's why sickle cell disease is a heterozygote advantage. If you have a normal allele for your blood and the sickle cell disease, and like I said, you have some advantage to malaria. However, it's also frequency dependent because if the mutated form becomes too abundant in the population, then too many people will develop sickle cell disease and that in itself causes problems. So there's this selection acting to balance the amount of the sickle cell allele in a population. So if it becomes too abundant, then it gets selected against, and if it becomes rare, it's selected for. And it's a heterozygote advantage because individuals that carry both versions of the alleles, like I said, have some resistance to malaria without the side effects of the disease. Now in general, we've gone over these different modes of selection. And just to sum it up, there's directional selection, which, which favors one extreme phenotype, you could have stabilizing selection, which favors phenotypes near the middle of a phenotypic range. You can have disruptive selection, which is going to favor the extreme phenotypes, and balancing selection, where no single phenotype is favored in all the, t all the time. It can vary based on how frequent that uh, phenotype becomes.